Everybody, welcome to Professor Jack Wertheimer. But first to announce the next two lectures. Uh, Professor Robert Wistrich will speak on two millennia of intellectual anti-Semitism. Uh, I suggested to him to, uh, to call it from the Egyptian priest Manito to John Mersheimer, but that he didn't want. Uh, it's on the uh, Tuesday, the 8th of, uh, of June at 10 a.m. and the lecture thereafter is by John Ruske on the challenges of the largest uh, American Jewish Federation, the New York Federation, which he heads, which is on Monday, the 21st of June. Uh, well, Jewish education, of course, is a key issue in uh, the future, in the present, and in the future of American Jewry. And Professor Wertheimer has really uh, done uh, pioneering work in the field and uh, to give us an understanding of that those of you who want to read more there is an interview with uh, Professor Wertheimer on the website of Changing Jewish Communities which you find on the website of the Glo uh, Institute for Global Jewish Affairs Professor Wertheimer the extent I have to introduce him is Professor of American Jewish History at the Jewish Theological Seminary. He's been there for um, a decade, the provost. He, his research focuses on organized American Jewish life since the end of the Second World War. He, in the field of education, he has edited two very interesting volumes of essay on Jewish education, Family Matters, Jewish Education in Age of Choice, and the other one, Learning and Community, Jewish Supplementary Education in the 21st Century. Both of them have been published by Brandeis University Press. He published a variety of reports for Avichai on Jewish education, and uh, uh, he has uh, dealt with a great variety of, uh, of aspects of education. So uh, the beauty of this is that you can get today a real overview of the major aspects rather than an insight in one very, very specific subfield. Jack, thank you very much. Thank you and good morning. It's uh, an honor to be back. Um, I was uh, invited to speak here two years ago and had a wonderful morning, and I was looking forward to being back again with you. Um, but I have to begin with a, an apology to you. Um, I'm upbeat about Jewish education, and uh, so I don't have a bad news story for you. Uh, I recently completed a series of short uh, columns that dealt with Jewish education on uh, this new online daily called Jewish Ideas Daily. Um, and um, when I completed the series of seven pieces, I got an email from uh, Elliot Abrams, uh, who said to me, Jack, that there's an imposter out there using your name, <laughs> writing in an upbeat tone. You have to do something about him. Um, and, uh, well, uh, I certainly am going to be introducing caveats uh, to my story. Uh, this, is not, this is not an entirely glowing story. Uh, it's nonetheless, I think, really a quite remarkable story uh, of what has happened over the course of the past 20 or 25 years in the United States. And so I want to be clear about that. My focus is on Jewish education in the United States. And also, just to harken back to some of uh, the introductory remarks um, that Manfred uh, so graciously uh, uttered about me, uh, I'm not a professor of education. Uh, I'm actually, I, my field is Jewish history, um, and uh, I have gradually worked my way toward uh, focusing primarily on post-World War II uh, American Jewish history, which some people would call journalism, um, but uh, so be it. I'm uh, focusing very much on the way in which the American Jewish community has evolved uh, since World War II. And what struck me as I was uh, working on different aspects of uh, the Jewish community, and some of you may recall that two years ago I spoke about the changing structure of the organized Jewish community in the United States and its fragmentation. Uh, but as I studied this community, what was striking to me was that uh, while there are many areas uh, to be deeply concerned about regarding American Jewry, 
uh, there's a great deal of ferment taking place uh, in the uh, field uh, of Jewish education. And I continue uh, to see that ferment occurring. And one of the things I need to discuss with you this morning is why that might be the case. What are some of the factors involved with it? And so while I'm tempted to refer to, uh, to call this lecture uh, the golden age of Jewish education in America, that may be overdoing it. But in comparison with earlier periods of American Jewish history, there is far greater attention being devoted today to Jewish education in, in all its complexity uh, than I believe in any other period uh, of American Jewish history. Whether that will be enough to sustain the American Jewish community is a question I will conclude with. Um, and so there is a question mark that, that uh, clearly hovers over us. Uh, but there's a great deal that is uh, taking place. And so I want to begin just by, uh, by to, to establish a foundation for us, is to just uh, indicate very briefly where we see changes taking place in Jewish education. And then uh, I'm going to turn to some of the larger questions of why. Uh, what are some of the broader fa forces that are at work that might be accounting, accounted for this? Um, the Union for Reform Judaism, uh, the, uh, which uh, is the umbrella uh, organization of the reform movement, created an education department uh, and then renamed it the Department of Lifelong Jewish Learning. Uh, and that, I think, captures uh, a, a key part of the shift that has taken place in American Jewish education, namely the understanding that Jewish education is not just for kids, uh, that this is a lifelong enterprise. Uh, now, just to anticipate uh, some of the concerns that I'll raise toward the end, the Department of Jewish Lifelong Education no longer exists. It was consolidated out of existence by the reform movement, which has undergone, as all uh, Jewish organizations virtually will have uh, a period of consolidation and constriction due to budgetary factors. But uh, the notion that Jewish education uh, begins with the very youngest and extends throughout life uh, has taken hold in many corners of the community. And so, for example, there has been, to start with the very youngest now, there has been a, uh, a new push to look upon early childhood education. This is preschool education, right? For the very youngest, we're talking about three and four year old uh, children uh, as a portal of entry into Jewish life, not only for the children, but for their parents as well. Uh, this is an opportunity uh, to, to invite into Jewish life uh, young parents or parents of young children. Uh, and so there's new thinking going on about how to do that. Um, both for the children as well as for the parents. One of the most dramatic examples for the children is a number of experiments that have been going on now for uh, the last decade or so of uh, Hebrew immersion programs for early childhood kids, uh, kids in early childhood programs. Um, this, uh, I'm proud to say actually, was spearheaded by uh, some colleagues of mine at the Jewish Theological Seminary. Uh, and um, uh, there are some places uh, throughout the United States that have persisted with this, understanding that early childhood uh, uh, kids, are uh, their minds are most receptive to taking in uh, a second language. In fact, the, the, the research indicates that until the age of seven, we don't even take a, a, treat a second language as a second language. It's learned the same way as a first language. This will take us very far afield, but the point is that there are experiments going on in uh, early childhood education. And as I noted also, in using this as an opportunity to draw in families that have been not connected to the Jewish community and giving the parents um, a, a taste of Jewish education in the hope that they will become partners in the enterprise of educating their own children. And then when we move beyond that, uh, we can take a look at uh, the growth of, of various types of formal education programs. Uh, what's most dramatic is uh, the growth of day school education in, in the United States. Now that obviously goes back to the middle decades of the 20th century. Uh, it continues to be overwhelmingly an orthodox phenomenon, uh, but uh, there has been growth 
uh, particularly in the last quarter of the 20th century, uh, in uh, conservative uh, Schechter uh, day schools, uh, in uh, day schools under reform auspices, and most dramatically now, and what are called community-based schools, which are outstripping both the conservative and the reform uh, combined. Um, and what that means is that we are seeing uh, a larger number of non-Orthodox <laughs> kids who are being exposed to Jewish day school education. Now, I, here I have to introduce a comparative note. Compared to uh, children in a great many other, if not all the other, uh, large Jewish communities or larger Jewish communities in the diaspora, American Jewry lags in day school education. Uh, if we take a look at the Canadian Jewish community, the Australian Jewish community, the South African Jewish community, the French Jewish community, the Anglo Jewish community, uh, the percentages of children getting a day school education there are higher. Um, and there's one important variable, uh, I don't know if it's the only one, but certainly an important variable here, and that is the difference is that in all of those communities, there is some government funding making its way into these day schools and making them, therefore, more affordable. In the United States, we are blessed with the separation of church and state, which some have referred to as a separationist faith of the American Jewish community. Uh, and uh, the American Jewish community has done a very good job of fighting any kind of, of um, uh, erosion in that separation of church and state, and therefore fighting any kind of government funding for Jewish day schools. Um, so much for the wisdom of the American Jewish community. But as a result of that, um, the costs of Jewish education and day schools is staggeringly high. Uh, there are, are day, um, this is not the, the norm, but there are day schools uh, in the United States whose tuition today is over $30,000 per year per child. Okay? Uh, now, again, that, those are the, the extremes. Um, but there are lots of day schools where the tuition is in the $20,000 a year range per child per year. Uh, and these are staggering sums of money. Um, and that's a major disincentive. There are other factors too, why American Jews send their kids to Jewish day schools at lower rates than other communities. But having said all of this, there has been a continuing growth in the number of children in Jewish day schools. Again, the most obvious or the most important reason for that is the increasing size of the Orthodox population. Um, and then on the supplementary school uh, front, uh, this is where most Jewish children in the United States still receive their Jewish education. Uh, what are supplementary schools? Sometimes they're referred to as congregational schools. Sometimes they're called Hebrew schools. And as uh, Leonard, uh, what's his name? Leonard Fine once said, um, uh, Hebrew school is the place where I did not learn Hebrew. Um, but nonetheless, they still have this moniker. Um, uh, I refer to them as supplementary schools. These are schools that are um, supplements to the either public education or private education that young Jews uh, receive. Um, these schools were the dominant form of Jewish education uh, in the middle decades of the 20th century, um, and their share of the market has declined because of the growth of day school education, uh, yet still uh, the, the largest sector of Jewish children in receiving a Jewish education are receiving one in, uh, in the supplementary schools. What's happening there is that a, a field that had been deeply demoralized uh, by all kinds of research that came out in the 1970s and 1980s uh, about uh, just how poor the education was, uh, has been working very hard to upgrade itself, uh, to rethink what supplementary education could be, uh, in some cases to expand the number of hours, to use Shabbat programming, to get parents involved. There are all kinds of experiments taking place in that arena. Uh, if you're interested in the discussion period, we can get into that a bit. Uh, suffice it to say that uh, there's new thinking and new energy going into supplementary education as well. Um, and then when we continue just uh, with the uh, uh, various forms of education that exist, the options that exist, uh, we have to turn to the in informal arena. Uh, and here primarily we're talking about Jewish summer camping, uh, which has gone through an enormous revival 
uh, uh, which I mean that that the emphasis on the Jewishness of Jewish summer camps uh, has increased. Um, uh, there are all kinds of efforts uh, underway to educate the staff members at the Jewish summer camps. I'm talking about uh, everything from the the denominational summer camps, so the reform movement, the conservative movement, and now even one Reconstructionist uh, residential summer camp, um, uh, including Orthodox uh, summer camps as well, uh, to JCC summer camps, to educate them that this is an invaluable opportunity where you have the kids uh, 24 hours uh, a day, seven days a week. Uh, for X number of weeks, whether it's three, four, five, six, seven weeks during the course of the summer. Uh, now, this is not a new idea. Uh, going back to the 1920s and 30s, the Jewish educators were saying this. One of the most important exponents of summer camping as, uh, as a vital opportunity for Jewish education was Mordecai Kaplan, who himself spent every summer in summer camps. Um, that's how important he regarded it. I'm talking about in the 30s and the 40s and 50s, uh, the last century. Um, but the, what's happening is that we're seeing a revival of this idea that this is an invaluable supplement to the Jewish education that young people receive all year long. Uh, and it's got to be infused with more Jewish content. Uh, and a lot of money is being poured into uh, this to uh, this being the education of the the, the, the camp uh, staff people so that they take advantage of this opportunity and we're seeing results uh, we're seeing important changes taking place in that regard other forms of, of informal education are uh, trips to Israel uh, we're particularly talking about teen trips to Israel which are being funded by federations which are being funded by synagogues uh, which are being competed with by Birthright Israel. Uh, tragically, there's some cases in which uh, the presence of Birthright Israel has destroyed some teen Israel experience programs. Why, you ask? Because parents say, why should I spend money sending my kids to Israel when they're age 16 or 17? Uh, in a year or two, they can go for free. Why, why should I have to spend the money on this? Um, but clearly, there still are teen programs that exist, and in some cases, more uh, teens are going through some of the established programs than ever before. And finally, I have to turn to youth movements, which are the weakest link of all. Um, there was a time when youth movements, uh, particularly under ideological auspices, were a factor uh, in American Jewish education. Uh, this is much more the case. This was much more the case in the 30s and 40s, and, and maybe into the 70s, latest. Um, uh, the ideological uh, youth movements, for the most part, have become quite weak. There are exceptions to this. B'nai Akiva is, is, a, is an exception to this. Um, perhaps um, the uh, the uh, Tel Yehuda, uh, what's the equivalent of Young Judea? I'm sorry, Young Judea, Young Judea. Judea thank you. Uh, equivalent uh, still has some uh, force to it. But there are other kinds of youth movement activities uh, taking place now, less ideologically than, than synagogue based, in which synagogues are developing youth programming for their teams. All of these are, are examples then of, of, uh, of informal education. I want to focus uh, uh, on, on a, an age group now that we uh, tend to overlook, uh, but where enormous changes have been taking place, and that is in the population of young adults, which is a terrible term to use because libraries in the United States have young adult sections and they're really for teenagers. I'm really referring to people in their 20s and 30s. Uh, and, um, I'm just wrapping up a large study of this population, and what's evident is the amount of pro educational programming that's taking place that's been, been created by young adults for their peers, for people in their 20s and 30s. Let's forget about young adults. Uh, I'm going to give you just a couple of examples of what I have in mind here. Um, first of all, there are these uh, so-called service uh, programs. Uh, you probably know that what has become 
for better or worse, very, very popular amongst uh, young American Jews. And I, re I just learned last, this week rather, about the similar trends within Israeli youth, uh, is providing service uh, of various sorts, social justice, uh, going into communities and doing community-based work with the poor, uh, with the uh, uneducated, and, and so on. Uh, this is going on in, in the United States. Uh, and what, uh, because there's a great deal of idealism amongst Jews in their 20s and 30s who want to give back, they want to do something. And uh, what uh, various organizations are trying to do now is to organize these young people, these idealistic young people, and to demonstrate to them that their idealism stems in part, or is congruent certainly, with Jewish texts. And so there's te text learning that takes place. Uh, in these service programs. Uh, I have some problems with how these uh, uh, take place, which we perhaps can get into at a later point, but there is an emphasis upon Jewish texts, which had never been there before. Um, and then, just to give you totally different types of examples, we have populations of, of immigrants in the United States, children of Russian Jews, for example, Jews from the, uh, from the FSU, uh, who are uh, going through various types of programs where they're being exposed to Jewish content, often for the first time. Uh, sometimes, in some cases, it's a more cultural content, it's, it's history. Uh, in other cases, they're being exposed uh, to aspects of Judaism uh, itself. Um, the same type of thing is going on with other immigrant populations in the United States. Uh, and on various levels, this education is taking place. I'll give you one last example. Um, outdoor activities. There are outdoor recreational activities that are being uh, sponsored by Jews. And the idea is to take young people who want to engage in these outdoor activities and to give them, again, some Jewish content, uh, connecting their, their love for the, uh, for the environment or their concern for the environment with, with Jewish texts. Um, exposing them or to the opportunity for some Shabbat experience as they're hiking and skiing on Shabbat. Should they be hiking and skiing on Shabbat? Well, that, that's a separate question. They're there. They're doing that. And so the idea is, let's try to reach them where they are and, and expose them to Jewish study. And finally, I want to turn to adult-adult uh, education, if you will, uh, looking at populations of adults who are in their uh, who are over uh, 40, perhaps, uh, and um, the spread of, of programs that are, that are focused on, uh, on adults. Uh, and by that, I, I mean national curricula that are being taught uh, well, across the country, uh, but trying to uh, do this in a more systematic fashion, rather than uh, a rabbi in his or her own synagogue devising some kind of curriculum to devise a national curriculum. And so we have this Florence Belton uh, adult uh, education uh, program, uh, the May Ah program, which was created in the Boston Hebrew College. And the largest of these, as I only discovered about whatever it was last fall, the largest national adult education program with a, a national curriculum is sponsored by uh, an organization called Chabad. It's called um, J, the JLI, the Jewish Learning, Learn, Learning Initiative. Right. Um, uh, and this, this is by far the largest program. Um, I never even knew of its existence until I met with the guy who runs it, and he blew me away by what he told me. Uh, a fascinating effort to create a, a, a set curriculum, to train Chabad rabbis uh, and, and uh, shluchot also to, to teach the material and to do it in a systematic fashion. Again, so it's not uh, the seat of your pants. Uh, all of these are reflective of, uh, of, of a push toward uh, adult education. Uh, and clearly, I, I've got to add here as, a, as a, an important uh, addition uh, the, the uh, enormous spread of Jewish education in the Orthodox world, uh, where uh, the emphasis upon ongoing learning uh, is, is very strong, very powerful. Uh, the phenomenal su success of the Dafyomi, uh, where there are tens of thousands of people.
people who engage in this, and there are all kinds of technologies now that, that serve as adjuncts uh, to this as well. Uh, to the existence of various types of video conferencing, uh, online uh, Jewish education, uh, really quite dramatic to behold. I could go on in this vein, but I, I, I really want to step back from all of this and to pose the question of, of what, how do we explain this? Um, why is it that there's so much of a greater emphasis today on Jewish education? The first part of the answer has to do with uh, you know, follow the money. Um, and, uh, and so I, I have to talk about the role of philanthropists in this. Um, it's, um, it, it is noteworthy that while the preponderant bulk of Jews who give philanthropy are giving their money outside of the Jewish community, there is a, an important minority of Jewish philanthropists <laughs> who are investing enormous amounts of money, and specifically in Jewish education. Um, this is true of the law, particularly of the largest uh, foundations uh, that take an interest in things Jewish. Education is at the center for them. Uh, Avi Chai is one example of this. The Jim Joseph Foundation is another example of this. Uh, there are there's now a Tikva Foundation which is pouring. Uh, significant amounts of money into Jewish education, um, and um, um, we certainly know also about the Wexner Foundation as an example, the Grinspoon Foundation, the Schusterman Foundation. Uh, these are all foundations that take a strong interest in Jewish education. Um, and on the local level, philanthropists are investing money in specific institutions as well. Um, so that, that uh, uh, day schools have, uh, in some places, have very strong champions. Um, uh, or summer camps do, or whatever the, 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 fa wherever the fancy takes some of these philanthropists. What, what I want to add to this is, is that the philanthropists have done something really quite remarkable in Jewish education that I don't think they've done nearly as much in any other sphere, namely, they have served as, not only as funders, but also as conveners and coordinators. Uh, meaning that they have, they have decided that it's not enough that we have a, a, a growth of day school education. We need to have some kind of organization that will work with these day schools. And so they created PEACH, this Partnership for Excellence in Jewish Education, which works with, with day schools. They have created something called Jesse, which is early childhood education. They've created something called Pelly, which deals with supplementary Jewish education. Uh, <coughs> left that. Camping, the, uh, the Foundation for Jewish Camp. Uh, these umbrella, national umbrella organizations did not exist in the past, and they exist primarily due to the, the pressure, the influence, the activism of, uh, of philanthropists. Um, and um, uh, you can't understand the story of Jewish education today uh, absent uh, the, the role of these uh, foundations and, and philanthropists. A second factor in understanding the, 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 the diversity of options that exist now in Jewish education um, stems from a very American, although I tend to think it's also a global phenomenon, that's, that's not unique to Jews at all, but that Jews are part of. And that is the consumer orientation that families are now taking to Jewish education. What do I mean by that? If we harken back to the period of the 1950s and 1960s, uh, what were Jewish educational choices about? Parents who, for the most part, uh, had been recent immigrants to the suburbs of the United States looked for the closest synagogue that was of their, of their flavor, and they enrolled their children in the synagogue school. And that was the end of the story. That's not what's happening anymore today. It's happening with some people, but that's not the predominant trend. What we now see is that there's a much greater uh, uh, tendency amongst parents to identify which type of schooling, let alone which school within that type, is the best fit for this child as opposed to that child of mine. 
And so it's not at all unusual anymore today that in a family of three children, let's say, each child will have had a totally different kind of Jewish education. One will have been sent to a day school, another one to a supplementary school, and the third will have received tutoring. Why? <laughs> because the parents decide that, that, that each of those is the best fit for this individual child. Now, this is you know, a consumer mindset. Um, and you, know, you can make of that what you will. Is this good news? Is this bad news? I can't answer that question right now. But I want to at least observe that something quite dramatic has changed. Uh, and so there's a much broader range of options out there because that's what parents are demanding. Now, I want to add one other layer to this, and that is that even as parents are looking for the best fit for their each individual child, they're also looking for the best fit for themselves. <coughs> in other words, they ask themselves, when I enroll a child in a particular school, what kind of of, of uh, per parent group am I going to be associating with? What's in it for me? Uh, and what, what we see developing is communities are developing around educational programs. Communities of parents I'm talking about now are developing around those, those programs. Um, uh, some colleagues of mine who are, uh, one of whom is here, Alex Pomson at the Hebrew <coughs> University, uh, and, uh, and uh, a co-author of his by the name of Randy uh, Schnur wrote a book about a, um, a Jewish community <laughs> in Toronto. Uh, and the, the, the whole thesis of that book is, is that the parents who send their children to this school chose this school because they, the parents, wanted to be part of a community that was being created by that school. Now, this places an enormous new burden upon schools, because schools are now expected not only to educate children, but to serve as a social gathering place and to an extent an educational source for the parents as well. I'm talking especially about day schools, uh, but it's not confined to day schools. Some of this is going on also in supplementary schools. Uh, it's a very different way of operating. Uh, and it's also part of this consumerism of what is in it for me, what can I get from out of it, uh, and, a, and, and a much more personal kind of approach to it, as opposed to saying, well, what's the nearest place, and that's where we will enroll our children. The next factor I would cite to explain what's going on, um, and also to, to note that the, uh, what, what's new, really, in what's going on, is that we also are witnessing the breakdown of some of the old institutions um, and the rise of new institutions uh, in Jewish education. Um, speaking about some of the newer institutions, I'm not saying this never existed before, but we are becoming aware, it's very hard to document uh, quantitatively, that homeschooling is on the increase uh, in the American Jewish community. Uh, and I'm talking here about homeschooling in the most uh, 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 intensive sectors and also in some of the less intensive sectors. There are people who are pulling their children out of Jewish day schools and they are either educating them themselves or they're pooling a couple of kids, hiring teachers of their, on their own, they feel far less expensively, uh, who are homeschooling these kids. And this is a direct outcome of two things. One, the economics of day school education, uh, and two, again, this notion that I want the best possible fit, the best possible education for my children. Why should I enroll my child in that school which doesn't necessarily work uh, for my child? And this is happening with parents who in the past had enrolled their kids in supplementary schools as well. They're hiring a tutor um, to work with their own children, so in some cases, they're being pooled, a bunch of children are receiving this as well. And so, uh, again, this, this is part of the diversification of the marketplace that's taking place and of the opportunities that, that uh, parents are availing themselves of. Um, and so tutoring is growing uh, as well. Um, there are also new players on the educational uh, scene today. Um, 
who are making an enormous uh, impact. And here I have to particularly make note of uh, Orthodox outreach uh, programs. There are, I believe, more Orthodox outreach workers than all other kinds of rabbis, certainly, combined in the United States. We're talking here about not only Chabad, we're talking about Aish, we're talking about community kolalim. There are 70 community kolalim in the United States. And they are working in Jewish communities um, with all kinds of Jews. And they're getting entree to all kinds of places. Uh, about a month ago, I had the opportunity to be in Phoenix. And um, I used that uh, as, an, as an opportunity to visit the Phoenix Community Colwell. And I met with, uh, I, I, I was invited, I called the, the head of the Colwell, sure, come, observe. It so happens that that particular evening there's going to be a Mishnah class for adults. So I came to this Mishnah class, and there were about uh, 10 or 12 uh, Chavrutat, two men each. All right? These men were all middle-aged to somewhat older men, and they're studying Mishnah. But they're not studying Mishnah you know, to kind of rattle their way through, if you will, to cover ground. But rather, the purpose of this was to teach these men the vocabulary and the, the structure, the deep structure of Mishnayot, with the purpose that these men would be able to then eventually learn on their own. Now, whether that's possible or not, I don't know. But that was the approach that, 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 that was taken in this setting. And there I sat with one Chavruta, and they are banging their heads against the wall, trying to figure out a Mishnah from Moed, which deals with the question of what are you, what are you to do uh, if there are beavers or moles or other types of animals that are burrowing underground into your fields and destroying the fields? Can you put out traps for them on Kalamo? And they're spending an hour and a half on this. And I was sitting there plotting because I was dying to ask them, why are you studying this? What does this mean to you? Right? And they were fully engrossed in this. Fully, you know, I, I was going out of my mind. They were fully engrossed in this. So I, I didn't have, I, I felt it was not my place to, to question them, to challenge them. So I sat afterwards with the Rebbeim who were there in this, in this colonel. And we started to talk about this. And what they said to me was, they're trying to empower these individuals by giving them the skills. You know, so the particular subject matter is secondary to the skill building. And, and the, 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 the people who were engaged in the study were not Orthodox Jews. <laughs> Fascinating. And this is going on all over the place. Okay, I don't want to exaggerate and make you think that, that millions of American Jews are engaged in studying uh, uh, the Mishnayot of, of Moe. Uh, but it's happening. It's happening. Um, and that, that's indicative of, of, I think, some very interesting new, new uh, developments. On the flip side of this, there are also losers in this process. And amongst the uh, most important losers in this, uh, in this uh, range of new developments, have been um, the uh, denominational day schools that are not orthodox, meaning the Schechter day schools, which have declined numerically. Um, the reform, there are very few reform day schools under reform auspices. I think there are only six or eight. The winners are these community day schools, which are non-denominational by definition. Um, and there too, one has to wonder uh, is this good news or is it bad news? Uh, how does a community day school operate uh, when it comes to being uh, uh, prescriptive as opposed to being descriptive? What, are they allow, what, what can they demand of their students or ask of their students? Another uh, group of uh, or institutions that are big losers in this process are boards uh, or bureaus of Jewish education, which in the past have been the central addresses locally for Jewish education, which have, been, have lost money, have lost status, uh, and in many communities have been either marginalized or completely put out of business. 
Uh, why? Because there are now these other types of national organizations that are becoming uh, players in, in this arena. Um, so, so, in other words, this new entrepreneurial spirit uh, is playing out in very interesting ways with some winners and losers. Having said uh, or, or all of this, I, I don't want to leave you with the impression that everything is hunky-dory. Um, there are some major challenges uh, that face uh, the field of Jewish education, and some of these are perennial ones. One of them is the whole question of personnel. Um, the American Jewish community in the past relied upon immigrants of various types to serve as the, kind of the, the backbone, if you will, of the educational um, uh, staffing. Um, at one point, it was Holocaust survivors. Uh, when I was getting my Jewish education, um, almost all of my Judaic studies teachers uh, spoke with accents uh, and were uh, uh, Holocaust survivors of one kind or another. Uh, at a later point, they were uh, Israelis uh, who were in the United States. Um, and there's far less of this going on. There's still lots of Israelis in the United States, uh, but they're not necessarily going to Jewish education. They're going into high tech. They're there for graduate studies and, and so on. Um, although Israelis clearly play a very important role <laughs> in the teaching of Hebrew. Day schools are very dependent upon uh, Israelis uh, to play that kind of a role. But the whole issue of, 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 of personnel is a major challenge that, that bedevils the field. And it does so uh, in part uh, because of the, um, the, the, the whole issue of, of salary and status. Um, that um, the salaries are, are clearly lower in Jewish education. Um, and it's even more so the case in part-time forms of Jewish education. Uh, who, who can put together a, a, a salary that they can live on uh, by teaching in part-time uh, settings? It's far more difficult to do. Um, and then uh, there is, as I said, also the status issue. Um, there's a long history to this. Uh, the Malamid uh, never really had great status uh, in, in Jewish life. <coughs> And part of what we're trying to do is to ratchet that up. And here again, I come back to the philanthropists and the foundations, which are trying to create opportunities of in-service programs for educators to give them the opportunity uh, to continue with their own learning and to give them a sense that they are part of something much larger, uh, which can enhance their sense of self-esteem, uh, which is, is critical in this. The second, uh, if you will, fly in the ointment that I have to make reference to is um, the, this looming issue, which is with us already, uh, of huge populations of children uh, who are involved in Jewish education um, who have non-Jewish parents, or a non-Jewish <laughs> parent. Uh, the reform movement undertook a survey of its own about, I think it's about four years ago, five years ago, and found that 49% of the children uh, receiving an education under reform auspices uh, had one parent who was not born Jewish. Uh, and if anything, those numbers are going to go up, those percentages are going to go up. Um, now, you, you can look upon this in two ways. On the one hand, look, they, they're getting the, a Jewish education, and the parents are enrolling them in Jewish education. Um, and those, that's a positive, and it may lead to uh, people identifying as Jews. Um, there was a long period of time when I served as an administrator primarily at JTS, and I didn't have a lot of teaching contact. When I resumed teaching, I discovered in amazement that in each of my classes there were children who were products, children students rather, who were products of, of intermarriage. But they were opting to study at JTS. So they clearly were amongst those who were most interested. Uh, the downside of this is, is that um, some of these uh, students are not only receiving a Jewish education. Some of them are, are also being enrolled in church schools, and they're going back and forth between these two. Um, and to what, 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 what kind of messages are they bringing into the educational process? Um, uh, I, I once quoted a, a, a researcher 
uh, who said uh, in the name of some uh, teachers, you know, we have these classes and, and students come in and they're confused, they conflate Moses and Jesus. So they can't quite figure out who's, who, who's, who said what. Um, so if anything, this is just a, a, a huge, huge uh, um, issue uh, in Jewish education that I don't think anybody's really quite figured out how to address. Do you mainstream people? Do you have separate, separate tracks? None of this has really been figured out. Finally, uh, I need to add one other fly in the ointment, and that is what I have described, and perhaps my exaggerated statement about a golden age, uh, raises the question of whether the economic downturn uh, that we are living through today um, is going to have a strongly uh, deleterious effect upon <coughs> the very important growth of Jewish education uh, in, in the decade and a half or two decades before the economic downturn. And I want to give you one uh, example of this, but, well, I'll give you more than one example, but to me the, the most dramatic example of this is um, the, the growing interest in and serious consideration of people across the spectrum in charter schools as a substitute for day school education. What are charter schools? Charter schools are, um, are public schools. They're funded uh, <laughs> by, uh, uh, by the public monies, uh, launched by, uh, with private philanthropy, but, but once they're launched, the funding is all public funding. Now, you, because, because of separation of church and state in the United States, charter schools are not Jewish schools. They cannot be Jewish schools. They're called Hebrew charter schools. And so in these charter schools, the emphasis is upon, uh, upon Hebrew language and Hebrew culture, whatever that is. Okay? But, but religion it has to be something separate. So we're kind of back again now in, in, uh, in, in Eastern Europe uh, under the communists where we're separating religion from, from Jewish culture. Right? These are two separate identities. Um, and and uh, we have to spell MS, you know, I and Mem, I and Samach, because we can't spell it Emet. Um, uh, I'm exaggerating here, but uh, the, the, it's the Hebrew content uh, that that is 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 key to charter schools, and uh, and the religious content has to be absent from these schools. Now, you may say, well, okay, fine. So this is you know, very nice. Um, I attended a, uh, a a discussion in which a representative of the Orthodox Union, the Union of Orthodox Congregations of America, publicly stated, we have to look seriously at charter schools. And I said, I happen to know this man for a long time, and I said to him, what? How could you say this? And he said to me, Jack, day schools are not sustainable. We have to find an alternative. Now, I'm not saying the OU, that that's the OU's position, but I'm saying that a very serious person within the OU said, we've got to take a close look at this. Now, please don't misunderstand me. The, the model that they have in mind is, so the morning is, will be devoted to the charter school, and the afternoon will be uh, a, a, a yeshiva type of program, all right? So that the Jews spend their money on the yeshiva part and the general education that is, is funded by the, you know, by the state. Um, but realize that charter schools, by law, have to be open to anybody. And you can't just have a Jewish population in a charter school. And that has implications for the socialization of young people. So the whole question of affordability has been um, in, intensified, heightened by, <coughs> excuse me, by this economic uh, crunch. Um, I could give you other examples. Uh, the education departments of uh, the conservative and the reform movements have been decimated uh, through this economic crisis. They virtually don't exist anymore today. Um, and uh, every not-for-profit institution, uh, not only Jewish ones, is struggling to survive in these, these economic circumstances. And all of that is having an impact uh, on, on various forms of Jewish education. 
is this a short-term problem? Is it a longer-term problem? Well, we don't know. We just follow the gyrations of the stock market in the last few weeks. Um, what are, the, what are the consequences of that going to be? We thought we were out of the water and things would, would improve, and, and now they, they're, they're, they've undergone a shock once again. Um, I want to uh, turn to um, one last issue before I, I, uh, I, I, I conclude. Um, about 20, 20 years or so ago, uh, Chaim Soloveitchik, uh, the noted uh, a uh, his, uh, historian of medieval Ashkenazic Jewish life, um, son of uh, the late uh, Rabbi Joseph Soloveitchik, uh, wrote a very influential article about American orthodoxy uh, called uh, Rupture and Reconstruction. And what he argued in that piece is, is that a fundamental change has occurred in uh, the orthodox world, which in the past uh, was far more of a mimetic culture, that is, uh, young people imitated what they learned in their families, that is, imitated the, the Judaism, the, Ju the lived Judaism of what they had picked up in their families, and in, now instead there's a far more school-based Judaism, uh, which uh, is picked up basically in the yeshivot. So that rather than following the traditions of their family members, uh, and of their ancestors, if you will, they're following what they've been taught in the texts by their rebellion. Um, I, I want to just build upon this in a slightly different way. I'm not, I'm not suggesting this is uh, universal. But to an extent, what we're seeing is an awareness, I believe, in the American Jewish community that the notion that you can pick up Jewishness almost through osmosis um, has been proved to be a failure. Um, and um, that we can no longer assume that, such, that something like that is going to, to enable the Jewish community to perpetuate itself. Uh, so there was a time, in, in certainly in the, in the 20th century, when you had an immigrant generation. And the immigrant generation did not invest a great deal in the Jewish education of its children. You learned, you learned by going to shul, you learned by seeing what was going on in the house. Um, uh, and there was this notion that, that the various components of Jewish life, especially the ethnic components, would be, would be passed down, transmitted from one generation to the next, again, through this kind of uh, osmotic process. I believe that by the end of the 20th century, um, a wide swath of the American Jewish community, community leadership concluded that this, this doesn't work. And we need to be far more self-conscious about how we educate the next generation. And we have to invest far more in exposing the younger generation, and all Jews for that matter, to ongoing Jewish learning. Right? And so I'm, I'm drawing a kind of parallel to what, what took place in the Orthodox world and extending it uh, within the larger American Jewish community. I think that, that uh, what has happened then is, is that, that uh, the American Jewish communal leadership, uh, at least those who are more farsighted, um, have bet on Jewish literacy as the far better approach than this you know, uh, process of osmosis. <coughs> the question that remains is whether that bet is going to pay off. Uh, there's an enormous investment of money that's going to Jewish education on the theory that this is the way in which we're going to rebuild American Jewish life. Forget about the talk, people love to talk about Renaissance taking place in the American Jewish community. Uh, I, don't, I don't want to get into Renaissance or not Renaissance, but rather that we need to make these kinds of investments in a very self-conscious fashion and expose Jews of all ages to Jewish education and that that will empower them to come back to what I quoted the, 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 the Rosh Kolel in Phoenix saying to me, and because I hear lots of people speaking that kind of language, that will empower Jews and that will enable them to reconnect uh, with Jewish life. Um, and so by way of conclusion, what I have to raise here is um, that there's a, there's a big risk that we're taking here. I don't know that we have a choice in the matter, but the risk is that we're betting that Jewish education is going 
to lead to Jewish living, to intensify Jewish living. And while on one level, uh, all of our emphasis on Talmud Torah, of the emphasis of rabbinic Judaism on that, has in essence made the same assumption that Talmud Torah is going to lead uh, to, to Jewish behavior. Uh, we have no guarantee that that's going to happen. We may have a much better informed Jewish population than ever before, uh, but we're not necessarily uh, going to know how this is going to translate into Jewish action. Um, on the positive side of this, what I, I can't resist set, telling you is that there's a whole other dimension to this story which I, I've, I've, I've omitted, and that is that small but perceptible numbers of non-Jews are coming into Jewish educational settings because they're really curious. And they're being welcomed into those settings. Now, I'll give you two examples of this. I have a good friend, a colleague, Baptist background, not Jewish, obviously, uh, from Baptist, okay, who told me, to my amazement, that every Shabbat morning, she and her husband go to a reformed temple where there is a Parshat HaShavua discussion. And she said, we love it, because we don't get this kind of thing in our churches, this kind of analysis, and the Midrashic approach, and you know, and darshning out what's, what's in the text. We don't get that. And she's welcomed there. Nobody asks, are you Jewish or are you not Jewish? Another example, I spoke with a Chabad rabbi, tells me that he loves it. He loves it when, when uh, clergy, Christian clergy, come to his classes. I said to him, why do you love that? He said, why do I love it? Because they bring the Jewish friends along. <laughs> <laughs> and and, and this, is, this is part of what we're seeing, that, that uh, the, this, this openness, this porousness of, 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 of Jewish life today is leading to the point where there are non-Jews who are coming into Jewish educational settings, and in some senses, they're making those settings more attractive through their presence. Now, I'm, please don't misunderstand me. I'm not saying, and therefore, they're going to convert. But that, too, is happening. The, the, the numbers of conversions of people who are exposed to Judaism is, is, seems to be on the rise in, in the Jewish uh, world as well. So we're seeing a lot of shifts taking place in Jewish education. <laughs> and to me, this really is a good news story. Thank you. Please along, I can't cope. Uh, OK, I have Isi Liebler, Leslie Wagner, Ardi Geldmans, Stephen Donchik, Howard Weisband, Professor Ben Lerner, Professor Bauer, Dr. Rosen, uh, Sarah Schmidt, sorry, uh, we, are, we are out. Uh, Professor Bauer, you have Professor Rosen, and Sarah Schmidt. I'm sorry to all those others, but we never take more than nine questions in three, three rounds of three. So, first one is Liebler, Professor, uh, then Professor Wagner, and then Adi Galba. Thank you very much. I think that all of us have benefited tremendously from this address and given us an insight. I think from those of us not from America, only in America certainly applies in relation to this Jewish educational scene. I'd like to ask you a cluster of questions around one issue. First of all, could you try to quantify in a very broad sense the extent of the educational involvement of those from non-orthodox backgrounds, percentage-wise, just a rough idea. Secondly, I, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm going to stop you because I want to be clear about the question. You're talking about how many children, how many adults? Uh, both. Well, both. The, the overall, the overall scene, how much it, it, it gets mm -hmm. there. Secondly, and more importantly, in terms of the ultimate objective and intermarriage, how much of this education has an impact? on intermarriage, or is it too early to judge? Is there any correlation? Or do we have a situation where, it, where education is wonderful, but without the involvement and involvement in Jewish life, it makes very little difference in the ultimate uh, breakdown? And the final subsection of this is, 
what does this Jewish education do uh, to youngsters, now I talk about youngsters, in relation to their attitudes towards Israel? Uh, Leslie? I echo um, Izzy's thanks, very stimulating. Um, I noticed that quite a lot, many of your explanations were on the supply side, that the philanthropists have decided to spend more money, or the leadership had decided this was the way forward. Uh, that doesn't explain why they thought that. The philanthropists don't throw their money around. So the question was, why did they think it was so? And I wonder if I could look at the demand side on the, the side of the community. You said my, my, accent, my knowledge and experience, expertise about uh, what happens in Anglo jewelry, where similar phenomena to what you said in American jewelry uh, show, uh, has been shown. When we try and explain why that was, why that's happened, you said there are differences in Britain, um, the state contributes. But that's been going on for years, and the demand wasn't there 20 years ago, so why has it changed while the demand? And the explanation given, often, is that parents have seen it, um, both in, for, the, for themselves, but for their children. Parents are really threatened by uh, assimilation. They realize that they are an assimilated community, particularly if they're not old enough. And that's where the growth has been. Um, they worry about it, and they see sending their child to a Jewish school as one way, but one attempt, perhaps the only attempt they can make. They're not going to change their lifestyle. They want to see if they can give their children some defense against the simulation tendencies. They realize that creates tension, so the child comes home and explains to them why they've got to keep, how they've got to keep Shabbat. But they're willing to live with that tension. And that's been a big force in all this evidence that we've got in Britain. The same for themselves as adults, going to much more uh, adult education. In their own lives, they try and see that as a defense mechanism. The other reason, it, which we see worldwide in Israel, is that education and learning has become ideologically neutral. We saw it in the Tikkun Leosha world recently, where the, the number of secular or non-Orthodox uh, evenings that were established. And it's been going on for years. So the idea that education is not, Jewish learning is not the product of the Orthodox. The Mud internationally has been doing that for years. And therefore, the notion that I can be any sort of Jew I want, but I can't be an ignorant Jew. I can defend any sort of Jew I am, but being ignorant Jew is something I can't defend. It's been a force certainly in Britain in the greater, and I wonder whether these demand side tendencies uh, Thank you, Jack. Ardi Galvin from Efrat. Uh, excellent, as usual. Uh, two questions. You, you designated yourself at the outset as an optimist and also at the conclusion. Um, and you're a historian of American Jewish life over the last 35, 40 years. Apart from the most insular Jewish communities in the United States, essentially the Orthodox and the ultra-Orthodox, in the long run, and I'm not asking you to be a prophet, but I'd like your opinion, can American Jewish education compete, successfully compete, with the tantalizing openness of uh, American society that has historically led to deep acculturation and, in many, many cases, uh, assimilation? And the second question, if you want to deal with it, is what is your take on the Peter Meinhardt article? Um, I should respond to these three yeah. uh, sets of questions first. Second, okay, so okay, good. So I, I, I'll try my best to respond to them. I've jotted down the, 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 the questions within questions here. Um, so the, the, the first uh, question uh, has to do with uh, the percentage of non-Orthodox Jews getting a Jewish education. Um, to, I have to take a step back and say that we're, the American Jewish community um, or communal leadership in its wisdom uh, has decided not to do a national Jewish population study for the year 2010. Every 10 years uh, this has taken place, we're not having one this year. Um, and uh, as a result of that, we are flying in, in the dark. We don't know. We don't know lots of things. We don't know a great deal of things. Um, and um, to be cynical about it, maybe we don't want to know. And that's why we're not doing this study. Uh, those who justify not doing the study say it's because it's so difficult to do. Uh, the, the, the methodological issues are in the way here. Uh, but I really think we're at a point where lots of people don't want to know. 
Um, and as a result of that, it's difficult to answer that, that quantitative question or any set of quantitative questions. Um, uh, the issue the, though, of those who are identified with uh, the conservative movement, with the reform movement, the, Re the reconstructionist movement, there we have a, a pretty good idea that, that these overwhelmingly send their children to receive some form of Jewish education. Talk about the children now, okay? Uh, by definition, that's what they're doing. In so many cases, they join a synagogue so precisely so their children will get a Jewish education, and Chas Vesholem, they themselves step foot in that synagogue, right? Uh, so that, that's, that, so that we know. What we don't know is the percentage of American Jews who are not involved with any of these movements, or to put it more accurately, there are big debates about this question. Uh, as you know, there are enormous debates about what's the, the total population size of the American Jews. When it comes to the adult education piece, there, to be sure, we're talking about minorities uh, who are involved with Jewish education. But what I'm arguing is, is that I think that they're growing minorities uh, who, are, who are getting involved. Um, large numbers, clearly they're not uh, getting a Jewish education. And the, the wild card in all of this, which I, I meant to, to mention, this is an opportunity to do so, is the internet. Uh, the internet is a source of, of information, certainly, and possibly of self-learning. Uh, and we have no way to know, uh, really, uh, how many people are taking advantage of that. Um, I, I've been involved in a project in which some, uh, w one of my colleagues has, has taken a look at various sites. And what we do know is, is that um, uh, the most popular Jewish internet sites are either um, the Jerusalem Post uh, uh, online, <coughs> the Jerusalem Post being the most uh, popular, um, or informa Jewish informational sites. So clearly people are going to the internet to try to pick up information. Is that learning, you know, what the consequences will be, we don't really know. Uh, to move on to the question of intermarriage and its in impact on that, um, I, I think it is too early. Uh, to, to know for sure. Uh, as you know, I'm sure, uh, claims have been made about the impact of birthright on rates of intermarriage. Um, it's somewhat um, ironic that the, the same people who've done research on birthright Israel, uh, claiming that it has lowered rates of intermarriage, those same people have put out studies claiming that intermarriage doesn't ma matter. So. If it intermarriage doesn't matter, then why are you touting birthright? Is okay. So this is part of the mishugas that goes on in the American Jewish community. But we really don't know yet what its impact is going to be. <laughs> what they were able to show is that in a particular cohort of people who came on birthright trips to Israel during the Intifada, uh, which was in itself a, a very small population and perhaps a self-selecting one, rates of intermarriage were lower, uh, which is significant. Um, but on the other hand, most of these, most of the, uh, the, the birthright people are not get married, right? Even for that, for that particular cohort. Uh, and the same can be said, obviously, for these other forms of, of, of Jewish education. What we can hope for, and, and this perhaps will connect also to your questions, what we can hope for is, is that as people get engaged in, in Jewish learning, which leads to a deeper connection with Jewish culture, um, broadly defined, Jewish civilization, if you will, that that will serve as an impediment to intermarriage, because they want to be with like-minded people. They will, but we don't know really for sure. The, the last point that you raise has to do with the connection between this Jewish education and relationship to Israel. Uh, and in this, I'm going to connect this also to the Beinart, because uh, I don't want to get very deeply involved in the Beinart um, uh, article. Um, I'm about to release a study through Avi Chai. Avi Chai is about to release a study of mine, uh, which I work with a group of, of, of uh, researchers on uh, it's a study of young Jewish leaders in their 20s and 30s. And what we found is that among the best educated Jewish leaders who have spent sustained time in Israel, I'm not talking about a birthright trip, I'm talking about four or more months of either study or work in Israel, um, they have a much better understanding of Israeli life and Israeli culture and Israeli politics <laughs> than do many of their peers, but they also tend to be far more critical of Israeli policies. So in other words, if you're asking whether this is going to lead to greater Israel advocacy, 
My answer is not necessarily so. Ironically, some of the more poorly informed people about the actual Israel are prepared to be the greatest advocates in behalf of Israel. That's not a happy answer I'm giving you, I realize, but that's what's playing out. Having said that, the great issue, the great debate that we're going to all have to face is, what do we do with the Peter Beinarts? Okay? The Peter Beinart is not anti-Israel. Uh, and uh, the people who signed this, uh, um, this this ad that was just put out. San Francisco. What? San Francisco Federation thing? No, 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 no. It was an ad for the sake of Zion. Okay? Uh, these are highly educated Jews um, who profess a love for Israel. And yet at the same time, they are uh, highly critical of Israeli policies. And we're going to have to figure out what, how, how are we going to get along with each other as Jews. Now, this is an issue that you face in this country every day as well, right? Uh, there are deep divisions over these issues. But you know, what it comes down to, to put it in very simplistic form, is, uh, is, is uh, criticism a sign of distancing? Uh, or is it a sign of engagement with Israel? It's not. Is it the same as 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 uh, as disinterest uh, or, or or distancing? Uh, what I'm but to, this is my long-winded way of saying to you that I don't know that Jewish education will necessarily um, um, galvanize greater lobbying in behalf of Israel. But it certainly uh, suggests so far that there's a greater understanding uh, and interest also in Israeli life, Israeli culture, Israeli movies, Israeli music, <coughs> which is not the same as the political dimension. Um, the questions about the, um, uh, the demand side of this story, um, yes, the threat to assimilation, uh, the threat of assimilation, rather, has motivated some parents. Um, but I think more is going on than that. Um, and uh, the more that's going on is, is that we're living through a period of time where, for a variety of reasons, people are getting more interested, to use the kind of the, the code word here, in questions of meaning, the meaning of life, right? And transcendent types of issues. Um, and I believe that, that is what, that's part of what's bringing people uh, to expose themselves to Jewish education. To go, go back to this group of uh, middle-aged men who are studying Mishnayot for the first time in their lives. They are they're searching for meaning. They want to connect with something. Um, and so it's not only a, um, a, a kind of a, a retreat um, and, or a, a defensive action regarding assimilation, uh, but that we're living through a time in which people are, are trying to, to, to hook, connect with something that's larger than them. Um, and that leads in many different possible directions, but one of them is it leads to greater Jewish <coughs> engagement as well. Um, having said that, um, I believe that, that the, uh, the, the, the philanthropists really are trying to, to create so many exciting opportunities that they will create a market in essence. Uh, and that's what, I think that's what Birthright is about, right? taking young people who probably never considered going to Israel, giving them this opportunity in the hope that this will then turn them on, quotation marks, uh, to all aspects of Jewish life. Um, and then the, the last point about the educationally neutral element. I think that that's a very important uh, subtext here. The creation of settings, and Limud is a perfect example of this, where Jews of all kinds can come together and study together. And here you, you see uh, so much of this taking place today in Israel also, where there are so-called Chiloni Jews who are saying um, the texts of our tradition do not only belong to the Orthodox. We want to have access as well. Now, I, I don't know the percentages that are involved, but I know that there are various institutions that have come into existence to make those texts accessible to these uh, chilonim. And I think we see counterparts to that uh, all over the, the Jewish world, and certainly uh, in the United States. Uh, so that there are a variety of factors that are feeding into this. And this neutral ground, let's all study together. Let's see what we can do <coughs> this together. This is a, a growing phenomenon. Um, and the, the, the last uh, of, of the uh, points, um, 
about, oh, about whether Jew, Jewish education can somehow um, um, help American Jews resist the, 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 the tides you know, of the openness. Um, I, I can't give you a, an unequivocal answer. For some, yes, and for some, no. Um, I think that um, the, um, the very openness of American society has made it possible for there to be now on hundreds of campuses or across the United States, Jewish studies programs. And there are uh, young uh, college-age students who are entering into those programs who tell my colleagues, because I hear it from my colleagues, I never learned any of this when I was a kid. Why not? I feel ripped off. Right? Uh, so the, the, what I'm trying to say is that the openness of American society, which we see often as a threat, also creates other opportunities. It cuts both ways. It cuts both ways. Exactly right. Yes. Um, and, and the example that I gave of non-Jews, right? That's, that's another example of the porousness, right? So the porousness leads to intermarriage. But it also leads to non-Jews being interested in studying Jewish texts. And in some cases, leading them to convert to Judaism. So it does cut both ways. If I had to bet on the proportions, the, the larger proportion, are, 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 we're going to lose more than we're going to win, but let's realize that it's not a total lose-lose situation. Round two? Yeah, round two. Uh, Dr. Stephen Donchik, uh, uh, Professor Ben Lerner, Professor Julian Bauer. You commented on um, implications for organizations in terms of the impact on BJEs, and you also mentioned with the development of PEJ as an example. But I was wondering if you could comment on a broader, um, in a broader way, um, what does this mean for an organization like Jesna? You know, is, is Jesna in with the trends that that um, you've been discussing and taking a leadership role? And also in terms of, um, I would say, a unique response. You know, it's almost a decade ago that Barry Schrage decided to invest in, in in CJP in, you know, really strengthening the role of the JCCs in the Boston area, and whether you see that um, JCCA playing a, a major role. Uh, ben. Well, thank you for a an excellent presentation. Uh, you certainly kept your word. You said you're going to give us an upbeat analysis, and I'm thinking back many, many years when, it, had you spoken then, you would not be able to do that. No, so, I don't think so. so. So I really appreciate hearing it. I was very happy to hear it. Uh, if, if I may just ask a question, uh, just to pick up a phrase that you gave, you said follow the money, and we know where that phrase comes from, right? Okay, from Deep Throat, and for those of you who don't remember that. But it's a good phrase to always uh, keep in mind, because it explains a lot of things. Uh, in many organizations. Uh, the, uh, you, you mentioned some of the uh, early Starkers who, who, who supported Jewish education. Uh, I might also add uh, Gruss, uh, who, uh, who brought in the non-religious uh, people in Federation who would not send their own children uh, to day schools and who were intermarried, but he gave them a challenge <coughs> and he said, here's my $1 million, dollars, here's my $2 million, dollars. you guys come up with the same. And he raised tremendous amounts. And he gave that. Uh, well, we also have to mention Rachman, who put enormous sums of money into Jewish education. We also have to mention uh, Torah Masora movement, which has been around, I don't know, it must be well over 50 years. And it started in the 40s. Yeah. 40s, yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and it is still very vibrant today, uh, the, the, and, and so on and so forth. But uh, as long as we're talking about the money, uh, can I just say that uh, your, your comment to consu about consumerism it's certainly very important to keep in mind. But that is one of the issues, uh, and you're correct me on this if you have any information on this, uh, that has been long missing in Jewish education. Uh, I have never come across any uh, uh, Jewish school which is willing to involve the parents in, uh, 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 by giving them information on how they spend the money. Uh, any Jewish organization. They, well, any Jewish organization, okay. <laughs> Except the interesting thing is, here in Israel, I understand what uh, Amotah puts out a 19-page report. So, so maybe they're better in Israel than in America. And nobody will give you any kind of information about anything in America. All they know is they just raise the tuition. Now, when I started my, uh, my children in school 45 years ago, and by the way, we had total Hebrew immersion in their yeshiva, so there's nothing new about that. 
uh, many schools had it in those days. Uh, I was paying the grand sum of $550 a year. But that was a lot of money uh, in, in those days, and it sure. wasn't easy to carry it. Sure. So, you know, uh, however, uh, well, we, we have to bear in mind that uh, it's not fair to, uh, to scare people off by telling them that tuition is, grows up as high as $40,000 a year. 30,000. 30, 30, 30,000 is closer to it, not 40. Yeshiva College went up to 40. Uh, but uh, those are just a few schools. There are dozens and dozens of schools which are charging as little as $5,000 a year. Yes. Now, uh, the reason we don't hear about them is because there have been so few studies of the orthodox. Uh, if you're talking about Jewish education, the, the, the major focus should be on the orthodox because that's where it's really happening. You have nearly 100% of the orthodox getting a Jewish education, and if you look at the reform, uh, well, let's forget, let's forget about the reform because it's so small, but if you look at the, uh, the, uh, the conservative, it's far less than 1% of the school-age population who are getting a day school education. It's not so, okay, so it's 1.8%. Okay, uh, but, but uh, I would like to see more studies of what is happening in education uh, of, of the Orthodox, because it's a tremendous field, and I don't know if anybody's really doing it. So I'd appreciate it if you, if you, you comment on that. Uh, first, uh, thank you for your, uh, your presentation. I have a question about uh, philanthropists. You said that it was very important that young philanthropists decided to put education on uh, very high in their priorities. Uh, my question is why, because I'm not sure. Uh, if I take the, the case of Montreal that I know, in the 70s, a Jewish day school was going to go bankrupt. And parents came, went to the Federation, and the answer was, education is not our priority. A few years later, there was a, a lockout. 5,000 kids without any kind of education for two months. And once again, the leaders didn't care. And suddenly, people with a lot of money, with very low background in Jewish education themselves, suddenly they decided to put education at, if not at the top, but very, very, very high in their hierarchy. My question is why? Mm -hmm. It's not only because of assimilation, in the case of Montreal, assimilation is uh, much lower than any, anywhere else in, the, in North America. Why would young Afghan people with a lot of money, without a, too much Jewish background in education, suddenly decide in the 90s and 2000s that education is important? Question. And a very good one. Yes. Let's take one more question and abolish the rest of the third round. Uh, You've talked about the ferment in uh, the way education is being delivered in the last 25 years. Have there been changes in the curricular content? In particular, a parochial question, how Israel is taught. Mm -hmm. A second question perhaps, just a curiosity, it used to be said, whether it was accurate or not, that uh, Israelis who moved to America were uh, quite standoffish vis-a-vis -vis the Jewish community. Um, and I'm asking regarding yet Jewish education, has that changed in the last 25 years? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Good. Thank you. Thank you for those questions. So, um, to, to begin with uh, the questions about uh, uh, Jesna and, uh, and the JCCs. Uh, Jesna um, uh, is the um, arm, if you will, of the Federation world uh, that, uh, that deals with the Jewish educational matters. Um, and um, I'd like to say off the record that uh, it has struggled mightily. And I, I mean, I, I, I've spoken to the people there, they, they're aware of this. It's very hard to, to address matters on a national level, um, for organizations to address matters on a national level. Um, now you could say, well, but Peach does it, and these other uh, you know, organizations are doing it. But, but JESNA uh, is not only trying to work on a national level, it's trying to do everything. And that's been part of its difficulty. Uh, it has not had a sharp focus on a specific area of, of Jewish education. And as a result of that, I think that it has uh, had a lot less influence and impact than it would have liked to have had. 
Uh, and then we can get into the side question of, of funding. In other words, why, why didn't big philanthropists decide to use Jesna as the vehicle as opposed to creating all these other new vehicles? And I think the answer is, is because they, they just didn't have the credibility uh, to, to, to do that. As to the question of the JCCs, uh, this is a mixed story. Uh, there are some JCCs uh, that have, and it's not only Barry Schrag, although he clearly is, is light years ahead of everybody else, um, but John Ruskay certainly is in this category. I think he's going to be speaking here. And I'm sure you can ask him similar types of questions. Uh, there are a number of uh, federations, rather, that, um, that uh, have been pushing their JCCs uh, to get much more involved, and there are some JCC leaders uh, who themselves have these commitments. Um, and um, so they are infusing, for example, their summer camps with much more Jewish content. Uh, they're trying to add more adult education programs within the JCC structure. But then there are other JCCs uh, which have very little of that content. Um, and so a lot depends on the local politics and a lot depends on the particular JCC heads uh, and, what, and what their priorities uh, are on this. In other words, I can't generalize to, to all the JCCs. Um, the questions about, um, uh, the, you've added some very important names of individuals, uh, philanthropists who've made an impact going back already to the 70s and the 80s, and I, I thank you for that. That's very helpful. Um, I, I want to I turn to your point, though, about um, uh, orthodox, uh, studying specifically orthodox uh, education. And there, um, the good news is, that a lot more really is being done now in studying Orthodox education. Um, the Azrieli School of Jewish Education, uh, under uh, the leadership of Richard Joel, as the president of the Jew University, uh, has expanded uh, vastly. Uh, its, its, uh, its faculty has expanded. Its purview has expanded. It has created a much closer contact uh, with, with day schools in different communities. And through that process, there's a lot more research going on about orth specifically orthodox education. In addition to that, I have to mention my, my uh, colleague at Abichai, Marvin Schick, who has conducted an ongoing series of censuses of Jewish day schools, which actually really um, provide us with a great deal of information. Um, and the, the, the most noteworthy, one of the most noteworthy aspects of what uh, Marvin Schick has discovered is, is that when we talk about uh, day school education, first of all, 80% of it is Orthodox. Uh, and then the majority of that is Haredi and Hasidic. Uh, modern Orthodox Jewish education um, uh, and so-called centrist Jewish uh, education and day schools are the smaller component of the Orthodox world's day school education, which I think has enormous implications for the direction of Orthodoxy in America, the future direction of orthodoxy uh, in America. But my, my, my larger point is, is that, that there is research that's coming out about uh, education under orthodox auspices. And you have uh, the, the programs uh, in, here in Israel, too, that are connecting with this, uh, that, that are involved not only in Israel, but also in the United States and Canada, such as the Lukstein Center at Bar Ilan University, uh, which is involved in in working specifically with Orthodox educators. <clears throat> to some extent, Pardes, which is an important theater institution for educators. Uh, they're not doing research, but, but they, in other words, it's not confined uh, only to the United States, but here too, there's work that's being done. Um, the other point that you raised um, was about, I wrote this down, I'm not sure I followed, parents and how, oh yes, how schools spend money, the lack of transparency. That was your question. Um, and um, uh, there's no question that that <coughs> used to be the case, and with some schools it still is the case, particularly amongst these smaller schools. You talked about the schools where tuition is $5,000, $6,000, uh, whatever, you know, these very low sums of money. Uh, the larger day schools are under enormous pressure to become a lot more transparent because parents are asking the question, so our tuition keeps on going up every year, it's two, three, four thousand dollars more, what is it that we're paying for? And so these schools are forced to be much more transparent. The smaller schools are not under that kind of pressure. 
largely because most of the kids there are get, receiving one form or another of, of scholarship assistance. But where parents are carrying the brunt of it, they're, they're demanding greater transparency. Um, and the, as to the last uh, uh, set of questions, um, why, uh, no, actually, well, the questions of why did philanthropists decide to invest in Jewish education? Um, I don't have a, a good answer to that question because I think a lot of it is idiosyncratic. What, what do I mean by that? Um, we know from a whole variety of studies that the large majority of philanthropists in the United States of Jewish origin give most of their money, I'm talking about 80, 90 percent, outside of the Jewish world. Now we're talking about a, a, a minority who give most, if not all, of their money just to Jewish courses. So, you know, what's, what, what's, what's, what, what motivates them to do that in the first place? And, then, and here, all kinds of idiosyncratic variables come into play. Uh, you know, the Avichai Foundation and, and Zalman Bernstein, uh, he became a Baal Tshuva. You know, who could, have, who could have predicted this? Had you traced his life? I did not know him personally, but from what I know about his earlier life, nobody could have imagined that he would have ended up the way he ended up. And, and the impact that, that his money would have here, as well as uh, in the United States and, and the former Soviet Union, for that matter. Uh, Shusterman, I mean, this family in, in Oklahoma, right? Uh, they came out of nowhere, in essence, right? So it, it, so much of this is idiosyncratic. In, in the specific case you gave was in Montreal, correct? I, I, can't, I can't tell you. I, I, all I'm saying is I think it's an excellent question. And if we knew the answer, I wish we could bottle it. Okay. I'll, give, I'll, give, I'll give you one more example of this. Um, the, there is a man by the name of Jeffrey Swartz, who is the head of a huge uh, shoe uh, and boot uh, manufacturing company in the uh, Boston area, New England, uh, called Timberland, Timberland Industries, okay? He is a major backer of day school education in the Boston area, right? Had, and to make it even more interesting, uh, his wife is on the board of the Solomon Chapter School. He is the president of the board of the Maimonides School, which is Orthodox, right? So it's all, again, it's, so much of it is idiosyncratic to the particular personalities that are involved, which is not a great answer, but it's the best I can come up with, really. And then uh, to the final set of questions, uh, your, issue, your question about curriculum is, is an excellent uh, question, and you're absolutely right. I, I talk more from the outside than what's going on within uh, these schools. Um, there is serious work that is being done on curricula, um, and that, that is partially being funded, again, by these philanthropists, um, or by uh, if you will, smaller fry philanthropists who take an interest in curriculum. The challenge with curriculum is not only writing the curriculum, but in training the faculty to implement that curriculum. So the case in point I would cite for you is a really, uh, from everything I understand, an extraordinary curriculum developed by the reform movement for its supplementary schools. And that was done with the, an investment of millions of dollars. The problem is, is that in the large majority of schools under reform auspices, the teachers don't have the wherewithal, personally, to be able to teach that, that curriculum. So it's now being adopted in more conservative schools. Right? Um, but, so curriculum is clearly is, is, on, is on the agenda, um, but curi curriculum in itself is not the solution because you also need the personnel who can, who can teach that curriculum. Um, there have been large investments in curricula in Hebrew language, specifically in the United States. There's this Neta curriculum, uh, as an example, uh, to try to give uh, Hebrew uh, education, uh, specifically, um, a much stronger basis. <coughs> and last of all, the role of Israelis in, in what? Remind me of the question? Their participation in Jewish education. <coughs> Their participation in Jewish education. Um, here, too, we have a complicated story. There are um, Israelis in the United States who remain largely aloof from the American Jewish community. And the way that they handle education is that they send their children back to Israel with, to stay with uncles and aunts and grandparents every summer 
so that they develop the Hebrew language <coughs> skills. Okay, um, and they're not—they're really not integrated, and they don't want to be integrated with the American Jewish community. Um, and then, then there were those Israelis who are getting involved uh, in the American Jewish community. But, but there was another dimension to this, and that you asked about, and that was Israel education specifically. That's the last, that point I want to end with. Um, and, and here, um, I don't have such a good news story for you. Um, Israel education <coughs> has become far more difficult than ever. I speak with educators who've been in, in the business for a long time, and what they tell me is 20, 25 years ago when I was teaching, I could just throw out names. And everybody in the class knew what I was talking about. I would, I'd say Golda, I'd say Dayan, I'd say uh, Ben Gurion. Uh, you know, everybody knew what I was talking about. Rabin. Right? Um, today, these names don't mean anything to young people. Um, and more to the point, they don't relate to the conditions in Israel. Um, their lives are so very different. Now, it's one thing when Israel is heroic, you know, and you can speak about great military victories against great odds. That, that gets the juices going. But now we have a much more complex Israel. And how do we tell that story? And um, you may, you may you know, frown at this and say this is terrible. But, but we all face a challenge here. And that is we have to come up with a better way uh, of, of connecting these young people with Israel. And uh, there, there is, the, the good news is, is that there's serious work that's going on precisely to do this. And, and in fact, I think it, at all the major universities in Israel, there are programs to develop Israel education. I know that's the case here at the Hebrew University. I know it's true at Tel Aviv uh, University. And I know it's true at Bar Ilan. Uh, with, in, in different ways, they're all working on this particular dimension. Last point here. Um, this book that, that came out about uh, three, four, five months ago, uh, Startup Nation, right? uh, which made a great impact. This is a way of talking about Israel that we haven't done in the past, and that young people <coughs> identify with. Um, it's a very different way of, of, of speaking about Israel. It's not an embattled Israel we're talking about. We're talking about an Israel where remarkable uh, changes are taking place, and more to the point, remarkable entrepreneurship is taking place. And that may be a way of, of uh, it may be a type of Israel education they haven't thought about in the past that really might enable young people to connect. So the, the, my larger point about Israel education is, is, is that it's a challenge that, that we all face in, in figuring out how to do it in a new way for a new generation. I thank you. Thank you very much for again very very interesting presentation, very very professional one. Hope to see you all at Robert Wister's lecture and at the John case. Which will depress you? <laughs>